We'll give it 30 more seconds just to allow a couple more folks to um, come in and then we'll go ahead and get started. And just to answer the question in the chat box, yes, we will be recording this webinar. So let's give folks a few seconds to join and then we'll go from there. All right, so for sake of time, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am, folks will just start coming in. Uh, but good afternoon, everybody. My name is Irene Rivera. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior policy advocate and organizer with the ACLU of Southern California. And first, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, for the release of our report. We're very excited to share um, some of the findings, but also uh, we're very excited to have some speakers talk about their own, like their own work around police free schools, local campaigns, as well as hear from some youth leaders talk about, uh, you know, firsthand experiences and also share what they're doing um, at their own schools related to this issue. So uh, we have about an hour um, and we have quite a list. Uh, we do have a section for Q&A um, towards the end of the webinar, but if you do have questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat box. We'll keep an eye on those. And if we, it seems like we're gonna go a little bit past 5.30. I know my colleagues um, from the ACLU are willing to stay a little bit past 5.30, but we wanna make sure that at least the most of the hour is dedicated to hearing from our guest. And as I mentioned earlier, we are recording the webinar. And so we will share the slides and the recording uh, as soon as it's ready. Now that I think everyone got a chance to RSVP. So we should have your emails. Um, and with that being said, uh, we're gonna go straight into it. You can go into the next slide. Uh, we're gonna have our, our first speaker, which is assembly member Ash Kara who is also the author of AB 610, which will eliminate most mandatory school reporting to law enforcement. So Assembly Member Kara, uh, we have about five minutes for this piece, so go ahead. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the ACLU and all the partners um, that uh, work with those of us in the legislature that are trying to put forward uh, progressive, thoughtful criminal justice reform uh, legislation. Uh, decades of research show the long-term harm to young people of even minimal contact with the juvenile or criminal legal systems. Once students uh, make contact with law enforcement, uh, they're less likely to graduate high school and, and more likely to wind up in jail or prison. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I worked as a public defender for 11 years. Uh, and regardless of the age of my clients, you know, even if they're well into their 20s or even 30s, oftentimes, especially for more serious um, offenses or consequences that they were facing, I would really dive deep into their background. And I would learn oftentimes that their first interaction with law enforcement and the criminal justice system was based upon conduct or, or interactions on school campuses. And so this is very real. And I know we're gonna be hearing from other um, system impacted folks about how real uh, it can be and, and the detrimental impact it has on our uh, community. And so, we, and so we, we know that our uh, existing system has led to these alarming disparities, uh, certainly in the types of students who are, who are most likely to suffer these harms. Uh, black students, Latino students, students of color, and students with dis disabilities are disproportionately referred to law enforcement, cited and arrested. Uh, existing law, in fact, often forces school administrators and staff to notify law enforcement, even when an administrator prefers an alternative approach. It takes that power away from administrators, oftentimes who know the students better than any law enforcement officer that would be on campus or coming onto the campus. Uh, these alternatives to addressing student misbehavior uh, have been uh, shown to ensure campus safety and, and not to ex exacerbate academic and criminal legal system disparities facing youth of color. As many uh, California educators seek to support students by responding to behavioral issues with needed services, um, regressive 90s eras, 
90s era tough on crime laws that reach beyond federal requirements remain in place. Uh, and, they, the, and they legally mandate school officials to notify law enforcement of certain behaviors. We need to keep these draconian laws from the past in the past. Uh, these laws you know, require notification regardless of the particular circumstances of the incident or the individual's, the individual student's situation. In some instances, uh, these laws even authorize fines for educators if they fail to report incidents. Uh, further, California students and parents can also be criminally prosecuted for willful disturbance of public schools or public school meetings. Uh, this unreasonably vague provision has led to students being arrested for offenses as simple as knocking on classroom doors when class is in session. A bill I authored as mentioned this year, AB 610, would address some of these issues in state statute by, first of all, eliminating state mandates for school notification of law enforcement, thereby empowering schools to adopt non-punitive, supportive, trauma-informed and health-based approaches to school-related behaviors. Uh, also, uh, increasing educator discretion in determining when to notify law enforcement about a student's school-related behaviors. Uh, it also would uh, eliminate prosecution of school staff who fail to report incidents of alleged assaults or physical threats against school employees, and eliminates the criminal penalty, penalty for willful disturbance of public schools and public school meetings. Essentially, what we have now is because there's a requirement to contact law enforcement, there really is no incentive to put in place other types of programming or support structures to deal with, with trauma, to deal with conflict, you know, alternative dispute resolution. There's no incentive for that because at the end of the day, they're required to call law enforcement. AB 610 is a common sense and evidence-based next step to keep students in the classroom where they can safely learn and thrive. But unfortunately, AB 610 is currently on hold for the legislative year as it was not set for a hearing in Assembly Education Committee. Uh, we hope to continue working on the issue uh, and with more evidence like the ACLU report, we can use this time to bring folks around to understanding how and why a mandatory law enforcement notification can be so harmful. Uh, Over-policing of children in our public schools has fueled the school to prison pipeline for too long. And I really appreciate all of you for being here to learn more about how we can end this pipeline and protect future, future generations of students. So please, you know, read the report, learn more about AB 610. We can use all the support we can get. Let's take the opportunity uh, over these next few weeks and months before we have an opportunity to have the bill heard again, to come together, educate ourselves and organize to make sure we can get AB 610 uh, heard in committee and ultimately all the way to the governor's desk. I'm looking forward to this to the to this convening and, and this hearing uh, and, and to hear more about the findings of the report and to hear from other individuals, particularly um, system impacted individuals. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Um, all right, so now we're gonna shift gears and talk about the report. So I'm gonna pass it off to my colleagues. Uh, Linnea Nelson, Victor Lung, and Amir Whitaker, who is actually joining us um, live outside our ACLU SoCal building. Um, but for folks uh, at the ACLU, you, you'll have 20 minutes for this section. And again, if you all have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll get to them uh, towards the end of the event. Great, so uh, my name is Victor Liano, my pronouns are he and his. Uh, I'm the Director of Education Equity for the ACLU of Southern California. Uh, bear with us a bit, Amir is streaming live, as you can see in one of the boxes uh, from uh, the BLM, BLM rally in front of the ACLU offices. And so we're not exactly sure what time he can go. So Linnea and I will go first and maybe we can pivot to him in a second. But so first, we just wanna recognize that this report builds on local efforts to eliminate police in schools that have been going on for decades. Um, for example, Black Organizing Project in Oakland, Cadre, BSS, Youth Justice Coalition in LA, and many, many others. Uh, some of whom are speaking today and some uh, at future events. Um, we also wanted to shout out Jessica Cobb, who is our fourth co-author, uh, but she is uh, just starting the semester, so wasn't able to present today. Um, so Linnea and I are gonna go through the report's findings uh, briefly. Uh, we don't have that much time, so we're just gonna highlight the top level findings. So we encourage you to do to please read the report and the fact sheet to see all the details. And you can always, always reach out to us as well if you wanna ever chat about anything. So 
this report uh, analyzes three data sets. Uh, the first is the federal civil rights data collection data uh, from 2017-18, which is the latest available data. We call that the CRDC data. The second is the California Racial and Identity Profiling Act. Uh, of the act is passed in 2015. The data is from 2019. Um, and then the third is almost a decade of data from Stockton Unified School District. So for the CRDC data, um, this data set is uh, from the federal government. All school districts across the US must report data about law enforcement, arrests, referrals, and other school climate data to the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. Uh, that office publishes data every few years. And so that's what we analyzed uh, for this report, at least for part of it. Um, first, we should preface all this by noting that the CRDC data is underreported and inaccurate. We know that. Uh, but because the California Department of Education does not independently collect this data, uh, it's the only data we have for a lot of school climate issues. So all we can do is try to minimize the reporting errors and try to draw the best conclusions we can. So we do have a ton of findings in the report, um, a lot of which we and others have previously published about how Black and Indigenous students and students with disabilities are disproportionately referred to police or cited and arrested, like Assemblymember Calra mentioned. Uh, but we have those figures all updated with the, the latest data. Um, so you can find those numbers in the report and we don't need to repeat them here. But given our short time, we want to draw one key finding out, which is that we compared referral rates to law enforcement and arrest rates for schools that have permanent police officers and schools that don't. And so, as you can see in the chart for refer referral rates to law enforcement, it's blatantly obvious that the presence of police in schools correlates extremely strongly. Oh, so Amir, it looks like Amir may be ready, but uh, I guess Amir, jump in if you can, and then we can come back to me. But for now, I'll just, I'll just keep going unless uh, it's time to switch over. But so, um, uh, the one key finding from, from this chart, it's obvious that the presence of police in schools correlates strongly with higher referral rates across all student categories. So for example, black students are almost five times more likely to be referred to police in a school with a permanent police officer than a school without one. We also looked at arrest rates and it shows very similar things. So permanent police also correlate with higher arrest rates across all student groups. For example, although the sample size is small, Native Americans, it's, it's incredible, are 35 times more likely to be arrested when they attend a school with a police officer than when they attend a school without one. And interestingly, and this was a surprising finding, white students have the second highest increase in arrest rate with schools with police. So a white student is almost eight times more likely to be arrested when they attend a school with a police officer when they attend a school without one. So Proponents of law enforcement in schools will say that schools with law enforcement, well, hey, they may have, they have more crime, they're more dangerous. You know, that's why we put officers in those schools. And I mean, we really don't think that's true. So what we did was we zoomed in on available data from one district to try to control for other factors. And so we looked at Baldwin Unified School District over about a period of 10 years. From 2010 to 2017, the district had no police on staff at all. They relied on outside law enforcement for anything they needed. In 2016, so the last year they didn't have school police, they referred 114 students to outside police. The next year, they started hiring school police officers. They hired six school-based police officers in 2017. After they hired those officers, referrals to police skyrocketed to almost 350 in that district. And the most interesting thing we found was that arrests actually declined, which suggests that Baldwin Park schools did not actually see more crime. They were not more dangerous. What was happening was that school staff were just referring a lot more students to police to handle these school-based issues uh, because a police officer was there and they just wanted, you know, just refer things to that officer. And what happened was the police officers were actually saying, no, we don't want to arrest these students. School staff should handle it. And so I think it's a nice uh, case study for how you know, there probably is causation here uh, that these schools are not more dangerous. And what you're seeing is when school-based police officers are assigned to schools, just arrest rate and referral rates just naturally go up. Uh, the great news is that this year, uh, the Baldwin Park School Board, um, hopefully because they recognize this problem, actually disbanded their school police department. So gratefully, those students are going back to school uh, without school police this year. Okay, moving on to the RIPA data, the second data set. 
Uh, first, we have this data at all because of really important work by Youth Justice Coalition, Dignity Power Now, AHA, and other partners. They passed this bill in 2015. It was a landmark bill. And this is actually a much more accurate data set than the CRDC data. But the law is being implemented slowly over a period of years. So right now, only 15 law enforcement agencies are reporting. More agencies are going to report each year. So we'll get a better and better picture of what's going on in the state in the next few years. Um, what this data is, is law enforcement agencies need to report data about each police stop in California, including those in schools. And it has to be disaggregated by race, age, location, and other factors. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Leah Nea now, but I'll pause just for a second to see if Amir uh, wants to jump in. If not, I'll pass it to Linnea. Okay, I'll go ahead then. Hi everyone, my name is Linnea Nelson. I use she and her, uh, and I am with the ACLU of Northern California. Thank you all for attending today. And I did just wanna say that um, we are remiss in not mentioning that uh, folks in Fresno have been fighting for years. Um, to make schools more inclusive and to fight against the presence of police in schools there. So, um, so thank you, Fresno, for all of the work that you are doing. Um, so moving into our findings regarding the RIPA data. So the RIPA data shows glaring disparities in law enforcement stops of youth at school. In 2019, the California's 15 largest law enforcement agencies reported 2,600 stops of students aged five to 19 in schools. 241 of those stops involved children aged 12 or younger, and 26 stops were of children aged five through nine. Black students are significantly overrepresented, making up 26% of law enforcement stops, although black students are only 7.6% of the population of the schools where the stops were made. You can see on the list on the right, some of the absurd offenses for which students were stopped by police, as was shown in this RIPA data, including saying offensive words and attending a prize fight. Next slide, please. Of the stops of students made by these major law enforcement agencies, nearly two thirds were for reasonable suspicion of a crime, which means the officer claimed to have reasonable suspicion that the person stopped was engaged in criminal activity. Sworn law, enforcement, so sworn law enforcement officers also made another 600 stops of children and youth to determine whether the student violated school policy or had some sort of violation of conduct under the education code. The data shows that black and Latina students' behaviors are more likely to be framed by police as criminal activity as opposed to a school policy or education code violation. Roughly 31% of stops related to calls for police with white students involved a suspected school policy or education code violation, compared to 19% of such calls for Latina students and 17% for Black students. Black students also suffered har harsher consequences from these interactions. Police handcuffed 16% of all students stopped, but 27% of all Black students stopped. Latina students had the highest rate of a stop resulting in a citation and black students had the highest rate of being arrested without a warrant. Next slide, please. So moving on to Stockton. Our report highlights comprehensive data on school discipline and policing that we obtained from the Stockton Unified School District through a series of Public Records Act requests. Next slide, please. The Stockton Education Equity Coalition, or SEEK, has been advocating for almost a decade to challenge systems of education inequity in Stockton Unified Schools and to eliminate school practices that push black and brown students out of schools. Stockton Unified has just over 35,000 students, making it one of the largest school districts in the Central Valley. A majority of students in the school district identify as Latina and black and about 350 students identify as Native American. The coalition through the ACLU was forced to sue the district in 2016 to obtain data related to school policing. The data we received in settlement of that lawsuit showed egregious racial disproportionalities in suspensions and school police contact. From July 2012 through November 2016, Black students were over three times more likely than every other student group in the district to be arrested or cited for the vague offense of disturbing the peace. Next slide, please. 
More recently, data covering the last few years show continuing severe racial disproportionalities. Analysis by the Social Movement Support Lab found that from 2015 to 2019, Black students were consistently suspended, suspensions are the orange bar on this graph, at two to two and a half times their rate of enrollment. Enrollment is the dark green bar. During that same period, Black students were also expelled, the light green bar, at rates three and a half to four and a half times their rate of enrollment in the district. Next slide, please. Native American students were booked or cited by Stockton Unified Police at five times their rate of enrollment at school. And black students were booked or cited at nearly three times their rate of enrollment. In 2019, black students were six and a half times more likely and Native American students were over three times more likely than white students to be booked or cited by Stockton Unified Police. And just to make this clear, because I realized I did in the beginning, Stockton Unified has their own police department. We've also found that Stockton Unified has been relying on police to visit students' homes during the pandemic. In fact, all school requests for Stockton Unified School Police assistance from April to June 2020 were for welfare checks, despite police being some of the least qualified and trained on the welfare of children. From July to September 2020, 66% of school requests for Stockton Unified Police assistance were for welfare checks. Other districts have much more appropriately used mental health professionals to check, on, to check on students during the pandemic. Next slide, please. In 2020, 79% of school requests for police assistance in Stockton Unified were resolved with no further police action, probably because the majority of these calls were for police to conduct a welfare check on a student. With the election of a more conservative school board last year, SEEK is in a movement building phase to dismantle the culture and practice of school policing and to build a liberatory education system for Stockton students. SEEK has developed rec recommendations over the course of years of advocacy, which are included in the report. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Amir Whitaker, who is live from the um, Black Lives Matter event in LA. As we wait for Amir to unmute, I um, just want to give a shout out to Dan Lose and, and the UCLA Civil Rights and Remedies Project. Um, they, they published a really incredible spreadsheet that shows secondary level referrals and arrests for every school district that's available at schooldisciplinedata.org. You can put it in the chat too. But Amir, uh, are you ready? here cool all right because we want to stream this live so we have over 130 people joining us on zoom peace y'all and apologies if i'm uh, buttoning a little bit too much so as joseph said today we released our report here at the aclu hold on one second yep we should be good yeah there we go thanks appreciate that so today we released another report at the aclu focused on school police, no police in school. And this is actually not our first report, but it's one of the most important because we did a few critical things. You know, it, it combines both federal data, state data, and even local data. Some of that collected here by Students Deserve. So let's make some noise. Shout out to Students Deserve. We did a survey with over 5,000 students overwhelmingly saying they support the defunding of the police and the redirecting of that, those funds for psychiatric social workers and other things to support students. That's right. Right? Yeah. Some of the things we did in the report, but we also took this new data called the, uh, they call it the RIPAA data, the racial profiling data that was just released in California. And last year they released some of the first findings that found that over 10 million people were stopped by police. In a single year, over 10 million people and thousands of those for students. And even within schools, almost 10% of those stopped and searched by police were under the age of 12, so small yeah. children, as young as eight. And this data, this those are the ones they're counting, right? Those are the ones they're counting, but we know officers don't keep track of everything, right? 
The data also show that some students went to school but left school in the school to prison and deportation pipeline. Several students in California entered the school doors, but when they exited, it was California Border Patrol or other entities taking them out. So in this report, we talked about the history of policing in schools specifically. So we know the history of police originated with white supremacy, originated with slave catchers or those who are catching the slave people. The origin of school police, similarly, especially here in LA, where in 1948, the first early part of the LA school police started as a, a, a security unit to fight integration as students were integrating in the school, which and that's something else ACLU was fighting here in SoCal in LA at the time. But the police were there to protect the establishment in school, right? And back in 1970, there were just 1% of schools had police. So about 200 officers nationwide. But today, we have over 40,000 police in schools. Just here in Los Angeles, they have more police, more than 200 police, more than police than they had in the entire nation in 1970, just two generations ago, right? So there was a time before we had police in every school where it wasn't normal. And there'll be a time after that, right? And that's what we're fighting for, right? Right. Right. We're lucky here to have one of our students from our Youth Liberty Squad. Elizabeth is actually, she's in her second year in our Youth Liberty Squad, and she's part of a statewide task force fighting to end school police. So she's gonna share some of her experience with that, some of her personal experience, y'all. Let's make some noise for Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Hi, how are you? Elizabeth, I'm a senior at Central Bravo Medical Diana High School in East LA. Um, well, I grew up in South Central since I was three, no, yeah, three years old. And honestly, like we are here fighting for our black and brown brothers and sisters. And um, well, <laughs> let me start off with my personal story. Um, so I'm from a Guatemalan background, but obviously I'm a darker Latinx person of color, and uh, most of my cousins look like me. Um, so he's a little bit older than me, but my cousin, he went to Catholic high school. And at that school, it's a school in South Central, if y'all didn't know, but he did not have much support there. There was constantly police there. Even now, in today's day, a couple blocks from my house, we have Jefferson High School, always, there's always police there. And he did not have much support. His teachers, there was constantly police there. Well, I talked to any of my older cousins, they, they always have a story of them being racially profiled. It's not anything new, it's something that sadly still happens today, and which is why we fight for this. But as for my cousin, things didn't end well for him. He ended up dropping out of school, he ended up in prison, he ended up getting deported. Mm, and sorry. as a little kid, I didn't understand. I'm a lot older now, and I'm here fighting for schools to be removed from our. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. For You're doing to be great. From our schools. Right. You know, I'm thankful to have a space here to talk and speak. And, you know, I'm a part of different committees, but. So what I'm here to talk about today is the statewide youth task force made up of 15 different organizations. So basically all summer we have been meeting weekly and we have been um, trying to draft up a um, list of demands that we are gonna take statewide. We are made of about 15 youth organizations and we do um, create this demand. We um, use these grassroots organizations to create them and in the moment we are still drafting them up but so far i think we are doing very well and pretty soon in the fall they will be um finalized and then we will start going a lot more public with them um but just to name a few of them um it's going to be students deserve yo cali um you'll serve this squad with the aclu i'm very thankful to your and um yeah, and it's a committee, but 
you know, we're here, we're all working together for the same cause. And I think that's about all I have to say. Um, thank you for having me. Thank Bye. you. much to Amir and Elizabeth who are um, who are able to join us live. Um, I know uh, we're going back and forth a little bit with the slides, but just to get us uh, back on this, I don't think one of our other youth is on um, Destiny, but very quickly, um, I can cover this for her. Uh, Amir mentioned the survey earlier, so just to recap, uh, earlier this year, uh, there was a survey of, of over 1,200 students across California and the survey did confirm that students are facing um, high levels of stress and trauma and need mental health res resources rather than policing. So you can see here some of the percentages of what students were sharing in this survey. Uh, more than half uh, reported that their mental health was being negatively impacted by the pandemic. 57% uh, of students you know, were reporting uh, not having access to a counselor or therapist in the past year and um, a little over half of the students also were just really overwhelmed with virtual learning. So I think this is very important to, to keep in mind and especially now that students have returned uh, most, for the most part in person and a lot of them are still carrying a lot of this with them um, as the school year has started. So, uh, next slide please. Oh, and then just very quickly, uh, part of the, the survey that was created earlier this year, um, uh, they created a word cloud that shared some of the five most common words that were shared with, uh, with students. So in 2020, you could see words as students or students feeling bored, lonely, overwhelmed, anxious, and sad. And um, when we did the second survey, uh, the survey again in, this year in 2021, a lot of the same words were popping up as students feeling tired, bored, stressed, overwhelmed, and sad. So these feelings um, and emotions that students are going through um, ever since the start of the pandemic, uh, they still continue to this day, even after more than uh, really about a year and a half. And so we have to keep in mind that these are the things that they're bringing in to the campuses. And so I think generally, if, you know, if we know that students are feeling a certain way and really need these mental health supports, having more police on campus is not gonna address these issues to make them feel supported. Um, okay, so with that, we are gonna pass it off. Uh, I believe it's Natalia uh, to also give us a little bit more um, insight into a survey that was created by a local organization, Students Deserve, as Amir mentioned earlier, um, to talk a little bit about the work and the campaign that they did. So go ahead, Natalia. Uh, hello, my name is Natalia Galeano, and um, I'm in the 12th grade. I attend Francisco Bravo Medical Magnet. I'm also a youth leader with Liberty Squad. And yeah, as Irene mentioned, uh, Students Deserve surveyed a few students not long ago, earlier this year, and they surveyed around 5,730 students. 87% of these students responded that they would be in support of defunding the police. And of these students, when they were asked the question, where should funds be, uh, should funds for school police be reallocated? They responded that 80% responded that they should be reallocated to psychiatric social workers, to college counselors, and to things like arts. Oh, and as you can see, uh, to the right, we have a word cloud where students also uh, responded what they believed that this fund should go into. And many of them responded things like arts, free meals, and teacher help. Yeah. And next slide. Thank you, Natalia. Um, and just to kind of keep the conversation going, I know some of the overall recommendations. I don't know if Amir is back. Um, if not, I can cover this slide for him. All right, I'll go ahead and do it for you, Amir. I know you're like moving around right now. 
Um, but uh, just generally the recommendation is that no schools in California, as we've mentioned um, quite a few times already, is that they should not have a permanent police officer. Uh, specifically, local education ag agencies uh, should not be able to create their own police departments or reserve forces, nor should they coordinate with any outside law enforcement agency to station law enforcement on a school campus. Um, and just to add a little bit more to this, this includes, you know, uh, school staff should never call a police officer to campus unless there is an imminent danger of serious physical injury or death to a person on school property. Uh, they should not replace law enforcement with surveillance and other school hardening measures. And finally, sh um, they should not invest in resources that will create better and more supportive um, vision of schools. And if you all want to take a look of a, uh, a great framework around this is that uh, you can check out Dignity in Schools uh, California framework for abolishing police and schools. And the link is there. And as I've mentioned in the past, uh, we are, we'll make sure that we share these slides and we have the links, I think, also towards the end of the presentation. All right, so uh, now to shift gears and just a quick reminder, that's a lot of information that we've gone over in terms of the report, but if you all uh, still have questions about uh, you know, what's included in the report, please uh, put them in the chat box and we'll make time towards the end of the presentation um, to address them. So now uh, we, I wanna pass it off to uh, a couple more youth to share a little bit more uh, about their experiences and stories, but also um, kind of do a quick review of at least what the Youth Liberty Squad um, has been doing in terms of our cops, um, counselors, not cops work. And so Aisha, I know you're in school right now and the alarm might go off, uh, but are you good to go? Oh, and I think you just muted yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear uh, the alarm a little bit. I don't know if it if we oh, should. Um, it just turned off right now. Oh, so this is, um, okay. So hello everyone. My name is Aisha Iqbal. I'm in the 12th grade and I attend Granada Hills Charter High School. I'm a part of YLS and I'm so excited to be here with all of you guys today. Um, one thing to just preface this is that the movement toward really uh, removing police on campus is one that is absolutely essential in the protection and well-being of students across the nation. So like those who've spoken previously, um, I think there are so many benefits towards removing cops from schools, but one that I would like to specifically address in relation to my personal experience is the impact that um, police and schools has on student mental health. Um, the alarm just went off again. Is it okay if I continue speaking or is it's is the alarm too loud? I, we can hear you pretty good. Uh, it's just in the background, so no worries. Go for it. But, uh, it's in the background. Okay. So to kind of talk about my experience, um, recently my school experienced a, um, a gun threat in which the LAPD deemed to be not credible. However, instead of listening to um, parental and student outcry to take measures such as sending students home, they decided to increase police presence on campus. This made several students of color specifically feel incredibly uncomfortable and unsafe. One student specifically that I spoke to said that they wished that they had at least tried to anticipate the effect that increased policing had on student mental health by maybe preparing a counseling sort of option. They said that they, um, they said something that I found really interesting, which was that the reason the administration did not care enough to prepare for this is because they did not anticipate preparing for the minority of students who are most likely to be affected or targeted. Um, for context, black students at my campus make up only 4.1% of the 6,000 students at my school. Therefore, they are the most underrepresented minority. Despite this fact, in this day and age, the administration should have accounted for this because one student made to feel unsafe on campus is already one student too many. This is why advocacy and action initiated by students is so important. And so to help some of the working here at students today, I'm going to give a review of a brief timeline of the youth Liberty Squad advocacy for hashtag cops, not counselors. So to start in May of 2019, students created banners to display at their schools that read counselors, not cops, students, not suspects, and resources, not police forces. In October of 2018, the ACLU gathered over 200 students for a multi-day youth um, um, advocacy institute. There, students learned about the UCLA, um, sorry, ACLU's um, cops, not counselors, and the, the decriminalization of campaigns. 
Um, in February, February of 2020, students presented at the California Association of School Counselors Conference about student mental health as a civil right. In April 2020, students created and administered a survey on the impact of COVID-19 on mental health, receiving amazing engagement. In May of 2020, students partnered with CASC for the first student mental health week. And in June 2020, another uh, um, a student named Anthony Alvarez testified in the California Senate Education Committee about counselors, not cops, and mental health. And then the next slide. Cool. And Aisha, uh, just for sake of time, uh, and I know we're trying to get on to the next one. Um, I think we're going to try to share the the link to the slide so that folks can see it because uh, I want to make sure that we have time for our other speakers but not sure what slide you all can see at the moment um, but I think what Aisha covered right now is a very quick uh, snapshot of just the various things that our wireless students have done around this issue um, and so if it's okay with you Aisha um, I just wanted to quickly pass it um, to well, Natalia, do you want to actually share what the first slide is really fast and, and then just um, the one after that? Um, yeah, as Aisha said, uh, YLS did send a letter to Governor Newsom not long ago and um, also to the superintendent. And here's a quick little snapshot of it, it has a brief information of um, what we believe that the governor, the governor Newsom and the superintendent should address. Things like so investment in virtual tutors, hosting town halls on student mental health and continuing to address the digital divide and inequalities presented in the transition to online learning. And uh, next slide. And here we have a list of all the community partners and some of the students who also signed on to the letter. Uh, we have organizations who signed on, such as the Dolores Huerta Foundation, LCHSC, and Public Advocates. Over 60 schools across California represented by signing on to this letter. And of course, we want to thank those organizations and schools for their support. Okay, great. Um, you can actually go to the next few slides because we're gonna now transition to hear from um, some of our other guests that are joining us today. Um, and so now I wanna pass it off to Carl Pinkston who is with Central Valley Movement Building. Um, Carl, I think you are on. And so uh, you can take it away and share a little bit about the local work that you all are doing. Yes, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Carl Pinkston from Black Parallel School Board and the uh, Central Valley Movement Building. Uh, Central Valley, um, we oftentimes describe it as Mississippi of the West. It's very conservative. It's very reactionary. It's uh, under-resourced, but overly uh, depressed um, and a, a, a huge amount of oppression. It has a history of struggle it's, but also a history of oppression. Uh, policing comes in many different forms um, from the early, um, uh, uh, you know, policing that had taken place beginning in Stockton, but also the policing of communities, the policing at, at work, uh, you know, the farm worker struggles is an example of disproportionate um, and over policing throughout our community and particularly um, people of color. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about is just a little bit about the Central Valley Movement Building and what we are all about. We came together in 2015, um, the Dolores Huerta Foundation and the Black Parallel School Board, to say that we need to move from moment of campaign to building a movement for transformation or change. And that we needed to um, uh, also bring the struggle uh, uh, as uh, uh, and, and highlight the struggles that have been taking place, particularly in Stockton, around the uh, policing in school. And that uh, we have a, a number of principles. One is that we, agree, we have a set of principles of engagement, that we will um, you know, build a Central Valley network and support and expand communities in their organizing network that we would share resources and experiences that is taking place in LA in the Bay Area. Bop was our guiding star in terms of the work that we were doing, particularly in Sacramento and in Fresno. Um, that we would have a five-year plan, that we would not just uh, be uh, a two-year 
or a two hour uh, motion picture moment, but that this is going to be a movement to engage the, the uh, parents and students to be leaders and organizers in the community. And most importantly, we said that we're gonna speak with one voice, but many action, that we will come at them in many different direction, but we will have one voice, a police free school. Um, and um, we, uh, through that work, uh, a couple of things have happened. Uh, you know, we have achieved uh, police free schools in Arvin and um, in Sacramento City Unified School District, ending the police contract. Um, in Mojave, which is down in Kern County, um, uh, which is, other people would know is as Trump country, um, was able to reduce funding uh, for police. Um, they were also able to retract authorization for police to intervene to uh, reduce. Uh, using the police for intervention um, as it relates to discipline in Payer. And, 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 and in Fresno, they were able to do work uh, around the um, you know, uh, equity board policy and, um, uh, and, and pu pu pushing it, uh, efforts as it relates to ethnic studies and then Sac City as well as you know, reimagining public safety. I'm not gonna speak too much about Stockton because we have another speaker who will, will speak more uh, Jasmine will speak more about what is happening in, in Stockton, but we're hitting all the various communities. We're working in small rural communities, in the Native American communities, um, in Indian country outside of the uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, there's efforts underway to engage those parents and tribal leaders as well as to uh, uh, talk about and begin to have the deep conversation about policing uh, uh, that takes place in many different forms, particularly as in terms of correctional officers or policing as in terms of, 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 of using uh, uh, correctional officers, probation officers, alternative uh, security to come in and um, criminalize our school. So we're, we're basically moving the, the narrative, pushing the demand, raising the consciousness of connection between racial capitalism and policing and criminalization and the vision for educational justice. And through all of that work, um, we're, we're in motion um, and, hope, and hopefully, uh, you know, and we believe we will be able to have a significant impact uh, for the rest of the state. Um, to have many different forces engage in this work and having uh, impact. The report, we, we strongly recommend people to read the report, of, though it's reflective of both California and gives examples of different places in, 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 in Stockton. Um, but it shows that uh, various communities, uh, uh, Lamore, which is a small community uh, that people don't really know about is highly uh, uh, police um, and criminalized, and you and and it impacts undocumented, impacts native community, it impacts dis people with disabilities, it impacts uh, as well as black and brown people. So it is it the 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 wave of criminalization and policing both on and off campus has disproportionately impact the, uh, the our uh, our young people mental health, social health. And future and rob them of their future uh, for generations to come. So we're doing all what we can to interrupt, disrupt, and transform um, with a new vision of what uh, uh, what we really would like to see a liberatory school, a police-free school looks like going forward. All right, thank you so much, Cara. Appreciate your uh, thoughts on sharing about this subject. So now we're gonna pass it off to Caroline. Um, Caroline, you have about like two, three minutes, if that's okay, so that we can hear from everybody. Oh, and Caroline is from the California Association of School Counselors. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so much of our advocacy work is focused on improving um, student support services, particularly mental health supports. Um, I think the big, um, idea is how do we move beyond carceral logic, this idea that of punishment as a mindset and return to um, the root of discipline. And when you think of discipline, the root word of discipline, it's a student and it's to teach. 
um, and to train and to educate. And so we believe schools should support the academic and social emotional development of students and really move to a culture of care. Um, so rather than investing in punitive measures such as uh, law enforcement officers and school uh, resource officers, um, we really believe districts and administrators should divert their funds to support staff, so school counselors, school psychologists, school social workers, to programming and resources that support and educate and guide students um, in the development of pro-social behaviors. And so research has demonstrated that school counselors do have a positive impact in reducing things such as absenteeism, improving student behavior, improving student climate. Um, because school counselors really have developed a relationship with students, they're uniquely positioned to advocate on students' behalf for the appropriate supports. And as Irene mentioned earlier, um, through the student wellness report, 66% of students reported their mental health was negatively impacted. And yet, um, they report 54% reported that there was a decrease in mental health supports during this time. And so California currently has some of the worst ratios in the nation when it comes to school-based mental health providers. The average school counselor ratio is one to 626. And when you look at the elementary level, that shoots up to one to about 900. And so you can imagine how difficult it is to provide supports to students with such high caseloads. And so how do we um, divert some of these funds to the resources that will truly benefit students and their development? And so that's really much of the work that we're doing. And I can provide um, in the chat, I'll drop some links that um, are guiding documents from CAS on um, best practices for utilizing mental health support staff that if you wanted to um, use and, and show your districts and your schools um, to advocate for these appropriate resources, you can as well. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, and again, if you all have any questions, please feel free to continue putting them in the Q&A um, as well as the chat box. We'll try to uh, make some time at the end of this um, to answer those. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Jasmine de la Fosse uh, from the Gathering for Justice. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jasmine Delafoss. Um, I'm with the Gathering for Justice. I'm also with the Stockton Education Equity Coalition. Just want to quickly take a moment to acknowledge all our partners in our coalition and all of the fierce and resilient students and folks who have been really committed to our fight, and especially Linnea Nelson, who's with the ACLU, who, ACLU who's continued to support Stockton. I've been a member with the Stockton Education Equity Coalition with the last nine years, where I began as a young person who was directly impacted because of all of the harms in Stockton. Uh, we heard a lot today, so I won't spend so much time really in the details, um, but I really just want to acknowledge all of the students who've been harmed and directly impacted by the violence and harm of Stockton Unified Police Department and students who've been currently failed by our current failed school district. Um, like many of you all, we've been in this collective fight to end policing in schools and the overcriminalization of youth and children. Uh, we've seen in 2020, like many of you, the uprise of schools wanting to now uh, decriminalize schools and, and end police on, on school campuses. Uh, we saw that in June of 2020, um, our former board of trustee, Lang Lung Tao, who's also on the call, uh, co-authored a resolution with our partners and folks from Stockton, like myself and those who are on the call, KCN and many other young people who wrote a resolution to promote shared safety for students and families to defund Stockton Unified Police. As we all know, like many communities in the Central Valley, who's con extremely conservative um, and decided uh, not to support that. And because of the lack of moral leadership in Stockton, we've seen uh, our school district continue to fail its students, uh, where we actually, rather than defund the police, we created a resolution that actually said, let us uh, protect our school police budget, where they protected the department not to defund. And so since this past year, we've been really fighting to create more um, ways for us to really rethink about how do we uh, do our work more intentionally and thankfully because of the efforts of seek we, we pushed uh, with the department of justice where we were able to uh, come into a settlement agreement around the discriminatory treatment of, uh, of students and, and students with disabilities that led into a settlement and quickly i'll just say um, what we have seen and because of that data we were able to recognize that 66 percent of the school request again while during the pandemic were for welfare checks. Um, and so of that, we know that we're concerned with how those situations are happening and that we know that 
Uh, what we're continuing to push is currently in our school district, we only have 34 clinicians. We're working to ensure that we increase our, our ratios. And, and this year, I'll end with that. We're already seeing that administrators and police are not adequately qualified or trained to de-escalate situations. We're just this last two weeks, we've seen a police officer uh, uh, rapidly attack some of our students by saying, I'm going to spray you with this, uh, with the pepper spray. We, we have videos of it going viral last week and, and where the officer is claiming to pull out a taser on students. We're currently in this, uh, in this environment where, where they're not able to, to meet the needs of our students. And so I say all of this because we're completely uh, committed and, and focused on unseating a lot of our failed board um, and, and continuing to raise our leadership so that we can have qualified leaders and community members who are actually doing what's right for students. And so obviously we don't have a lot of time. I hope you all continue to the read the report. We spend a lot of time uh, putting our recommendations in there and so many great leaders on here. Just thank you to the ACLU and our committee uh, for allowing Stockton to really share our voice um, and giving us the, the time to really amplify uh, the resources and needs around the state and really in Stockton. So thank you all, thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine, uh, for sharing just your wisdom and thoughts and, and just really experience with this. Um, and finally, I'm going to pass it off to David Turner, though I feel like I can, can I now call you Dr. Turner? Is, this, is it officially official? Uh, so um, if that's the case, Dr. Turner with Brother Sun Selves Coalition. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I definitely want to give a big shout out to the um, to the ACLU uh, for putting together another outstanding report um, on why we need, um, you know, police free schools. So I think to that point, um, definitely want to underscore a couple of things. Right. Um, so you have heard the catchphrases. We have all heard the catchphrases. Books, not bars. Education, not incarceration. Schools, not prisons. Counselors, not cops, right? Um, I think we've been very clear, right, over the last 30 years about what our messaging is and about what it is we want for our young people. And what we want is that we know our young people deserve investment. We know our young people deserve dignity. Our young people deserve respect. And our young people deserve to be treated like human beings full of value and potential and not criminalized and surveilled on the school campuses. The fight for racial justice here in California and across this nation has been one of us working to decriminalize our schools, right? Places that should be um, spaces for safety, places that should be spaces um, where our young people can go and learn and grow, not necessarily, right, you know, end up in handcuffs. Now, with that being said, right, like we know that these conditions exist. I don't have to run through the stats. They already did that, right? But what I, what I will also run down is that we have a history of legacy and resistance where we will not sit here and, and accept what has happened in our communities. So to run down a couple of things that have happened in LA, right? So uh, first of all, LAUSD schools do not look the same as when I was attending LAUSD schools, going to Horse Man in 135th Street Elementary, right? Um, that's because of the organizing and the advocacy of partners like Community Coalition, Inner City Struggle, the Labor Community Strategy Center, Students Deserve, Brother Son Selves, My Coalition, the Youth Justice Coalition, uh, Cadre, and so many others who have put in work to transform our schools and communities. For example, whether we're talking about, um, you know, laying the foundation for uh, for alternatives, right, to over-discipline, right? Like we have to look to folks like Cadre who help pass the positive uh, behavior intervention and supports here in LAUSD. Or whether we're talking about the School Climate Bill of Rights that the Brother Sun Sales Coalition helped to get passed that ended willful defiance for grades K through 12, or whether we're talking about the abolitionist vision of the Labor Community Strategy Center to eliminate LAUSD's 1033 program. Y'all, can, can you believe that there were young people going to schools, right, where school police officers had rocket launchers, but we do not have books, we don't have computers? That is a problem. Right, and more recently, um, working with um, organizations like Students Deserve, right, who helped to anchor some of the coalitions that led to the uh, elimination of random searches, that led to right the end in the use of pepper spray, and I think the most significant of all, divesting twenty-five million dollars 
from school funding to invest it in black student achievement, right? To literally take money from the carceral regime that harms black communities and then give it to black communities. I think it was definitely one of the um, one of the most proudest moments of my organizing career and definitely excited that I got a chance to be a part of it. So um, with that being said, right, that led to an initiative here in Los Angeles um, for a $95 million Black Student Achievement Plan that we're using as the incubator for us to rethink school safety, for us to rethink you know, what, it, what it means to be safe on our schools, right? So to wrap up, we know that there is a better way. We know that we can do better. We know that our schools, our students, and our communities deserve to live a life without fear and criminalization. Um, we can have police-free schools, not only in Los Angeles, but across the entire state of California. And this includes schools that prioritize restoration, that have things like ethnic studies, right? That um, prioritize relationship building, right? That are community-driven and community-led. We know that we can have schools like this and we want to urge our state officials as well as our local officials right who um who as jasmine just said sometimes and a lot of times do not have the political courage to stand with the people i just want to ask what side of history do you want to be on when it is time right to assess where things were supposed to be what side of history do you want to be on right like when we actually transform schools when we get rid of these archaic systems right that are rooted in fear and control what side of history do you want to be on and we want to urge elected officials both locally and across the state right to imagine and engage in the work to create pol police free schools with us thank you very much Thank you so much, David. And again, just thank you to everyone, to all the speakers um, who shared a little bit, gave us a little bit more insight about what is happening locally. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide um, as we start to wrap up, uh, we just wanted to share uh, a couple ways that folks can get involved and support and, and just our general call to action. So as we mentioned, uh, the report is up that uh, we have the link up in the slide. I think it's also been shared in the chat box. There's several local campaigns going on. So if you're in LA, Pomona, Central Valley, Stock, uh, Stockton, Oakland, Antelope, uh, Antelope Valley, Fresno, I'm pretty sure there might be even more that are not on here, uh, but please take a screenshot of this if you like, just to get some information or know who to follow up with um, on, a, on, a, on a more local level. Again, support AB 610, uh, which Assembly Member Ash Kara talked about earlier. And as a quick refresher, this is a bill that would eliminate most mandatory notification uh, to law enforcement. And finally, if anybody here is um, centered or local, uh, local to Riverside, we're going to have a very similar event tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. That is a link to register. And we're going to be focusing specifically on data and hearing from speakers um, from the Riverside County area. Um, and then next slide, please. And again, uh, I won't go over the links and resources, but we try to put the majority of them on here in terms of the report, um, other reports that the ACLU um, has written, as well as a few social media handles for folks. And so uh, with that, I know it's now uh, 5.02, so we're past two minutes, but um, if, if folks want to stick around, I, I think there were a few questions in the chat, uh, in the chat box in the Q&A space. Uh, folks are welcome to stay on. Uh, if you have to drop off, no worries. As I mentioned, we are recording uh, the webinar. But again, I just want to thank everybody uh, from, from speakers to guests to the youth to, um, for sharing their insight, uh, their wisdom and sharing a little bit more about what's going on on a local level across the state. So thank you all um, for all for your time and just a dedication. And remember, let's get rid of police. We really don't need them in any of our schools um, across California and really in the nation. So uh, with that, let's go through the questions. Um, I'm happy to read some of them and maybe for folks, uh, we can kind of just do it that way. Uh, so I'll go backwards. I know one of the question um, on here was uh, from Michelle Ruiz, how did ACLU include campaigns from different counties? And anybody can take it. So 
um, as far as Stockton, we made that decision because we've been working in the Stockton Education Equity Co Coalition for almost a decade. And um, it seemed like it was a really important, not only a comprehensive data set that we could really use and analyze to show, to go deep, but also to highlight the important advocacy that's going on there. Um, and then other um, school districts and local advocacy was highlighted based on you know, what we had heard, what we knew, um, and yeah, it was not intended to be a comprehensive list. And so I'm so sorry if we missed a couple of, of, of those regions. Yeah, and I'll just add um, beyond all of the regions, this in the report, obviously, Los Angeles, Smyrna Valley, uh, places like that. Um, we are going to be having a series of follow up events to highlight local campaigns, uh, really for the next two or three months um, until the next legislative state of cycle uh, starts again. And so watch out for that. We're going to send the schedules, but hopefully you'll see a lot more local campaigns featured um, in, in those events. All right, just seeing if anybody else wants to add to this one. If not, um, we can go to the next question. This is from Anne um, asked, should we advocate for California to collect their own data? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, as our colleague Dan has been pushing for a little while, it's it's important. Um, but the the issue is they're they're legally obligated to do it anyway. They just are not doing it. So it really is a matter of enforcement rather than changing the law. Um, and then uh, I'll just add this RIPA data is really exciting. It's some of the most detailed information in the country. And so in the next three or four years, even without the California Department of Education collecting different data. Uh, we should have some, some pretty good uh, numbers to review to, to find out the impact here. And I don't know if Amir is in a place where he can weigh in on this, but he's really the, the data expert on this team and did the hard work here. Um, certainly, we know that there is more data that should be collected and publicly distributed. Amir might not be able to um, add a little bit more to this, but uh, let's go on to the next question. Um, so the question is, and, well, an argument made by those who support SROs is that when cops are present, it reduces arrest as the cops on campus prefer to be more lenient with students. Does the VPSD data show a drop in arrests to support this claim? It does show uh, a drop in arrest, but I, I would argue it doesn't support that claim. Um, I think it would support uh, my, my uh, under, or I guess, um, hypothesis is that uh, it shows that those schools were and continue to be safe. Um, I think there is a real danger to law enforcement playing the role that counselors and restorative justice uh, coordinators and social workers should be playing in schools uh, because uh, we shouldn't be trying to uh, train police officers uh, to play that role because at the end of the day, their job is to enforce the law and to cite and arrest. And uh, when they start to play that role, um, you know, students providing information to law enforcement um, ends up, they end up saying things that harm them, things that, you know, uh, end up by, uh, potentially uh, getting them or their families in trouble. So it really makes a lot more sense for mental health professionals, school-based uh, staff to, to take those roles rather than law enforcement. I see Caroline is there and she's, she's the expert. Um, so I'll pass it to her as well. To yeah, so I just wanted to add to that. Um, when uh, law enforcement officers or school resource officers take on this role, um, as you mentioned, Vincent, their job is to enforce laws and rules. And so when their presence is tied to mental health supports or mental health issues, what it does is further stigmatize mental health and the, it attaches the idea that something's wrong with me if I'm in need of support or, or with what I'm feeling right now because I'm feeling, I have these big feelings or these behaviors that are happening as a result of my mental wellness. And rather than getting supports, I'm, seeing a law enforcement officer. So it, it further stigmatizes mental health and it makes students less likely to seek out supports. And I was wondering if any of our other panelists wanted to weigh in on, on that question as well, that the idea that um, having police in schools reduces arrests. Okay. 
Okay, I will leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Linnea. All right, um, and actually, I think these next few questions um, can really be answered by uh, by our guest, uh, not only just ASOU SoCal, but we have one here that's asking, what's the best way to get their folks who don't understand the harms caused by over-policing the school to prison pipeline and or police in schools? I can speak from my experience um, and then others can speak to, you know, um, of the panelists can speak to the experience. Number one, what we use, we start with data. So the first thing we do is provide the data for folks and the data oftentimes speaks for itself. Second, there's a number of, of research that have been done, you know, num I mean, a, a, a slew of ACLU reports, but sometimes they say that's partisan. So we have other peer review research data that we uh, um, provided. Th three, we get them in front, because we had to do this for our school board members. So when you're in a campaign in a, in a very conservative area, there's a lot of different tactics that you have to do. So the other is having them speak directly to a youth who's been impacted by the police. Let them tell their story, personal trauma, the, the, the after effect. All of that um, um, helps to move them in, the, in a different direction. And then lastly, um, point out the contradiction between policing for students of color and policing for white students. So what we've oftentimes used the example of in, in Sacramento, North, the next county up is Placid County. There's more crime, there's actually more crime among, among whites up in that county and particularly in the school than there is in our schools. So, but what happens is whenever something goes bad in the white community in the schools, we get police. And so it's the disproportionality in how they respond to stuff. And, and then um, lastly, we just show that the outcome of policing, um, there's, a, there's a correlation uh, and an outcome, but a correlation between poor schools, dysfunctional schools, schools that produce bad outcome and, and why we have police. Uh, uh, and they don't necessarily come as SROs, some come as probation officers. They come in many different forms, security, many different forms, but we don't have enough counselors, support services, nurses, and other reasons. So we, we, we provide all that when we're making our case. And then if nothing else, we have to um, really just pour it on um, and keep the pressure on. Thank you, Carl. Um, okay, unless anybody else wants to chime in on this one, uh, I'll move on to the next question. This is specific to AB 610. Um, so are there um, like specific next steps that folks can do? It's like, what can you know folks do to help AB 610 um, kind of move along? Yeah, I can say, uh, say this one real quick. Um, yeah, we definitely need a lot of support, um, as particularly doing a lot of public education to run up to the next legislative cycle, which is, starts in January. Um, we put an email there. Uh, Kathy Schur um, is one of the leaders uh, you know, um, in supporting the bill. And so she can provide you with kind of the specific kind of outlets to support. But uh, what, what she'll say is, um, we have we are collecting stories from educators, students, and parents about students who have been improperly referred to law enforcement and the harms. Uh, we need folks from organizations and individually to submit letters to legislators and to other policymakers. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, I think we are developing a petition as well, um, so we can present uh, all the public support uh, for the bill. And then there will be many others, um, lots of events, lots of rallies, maybe some phone banking uh, in the spring. So uh, email Kathy, we'll, we'll uh, record your name and uh, we'll loop you into all the, the efforts in the coming months. Great, thank you, Victor. Um, there's also a question here around what can statewide advocacy organizations aligned with this righteous work do to support? Um, I think generally speaking, uh, I, I, Victor was specific around 610, but I think you all saw here, like there's a lot of great partners 
um, just throughout the state, organizations, young people who are doing um, these campaigns. So definitely uh, when we send out the slides, look out for those links so you know who to connect with. Uh, you can email us and we can try to connect you with the right folks so that um, you know, you can be a part of those campaigns, but also uh, just stay in the loop, right? Um, you know, the report is one great way to do it because now we have a whole bunch of really important data and, and facts that I think the more that folks know and learn and understand this information, I think it helps us move one step closer to police free schools. Um, but oftentimes, a lot, you know, it, it really depends if it's a statewide. Um, campaign or if it's a local one, sometimes even just showing up, signing petitions, calling folks, uh, mass taxi, like the list goes on and on. There's uh, a lot that we can do and so many great folks throughout the state that are doing amazing work and for years that have been doing it. So I think just try to connect with the folks that uh, are probably the, more, the most local to you um, and just stay connected. But at least that's in my opinion and what I think. And I think uh, Carl had mentioned earlier about just listening to the youth. I think that's very important because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are being directly impacted by this issue. And if we're not hearing from them directly or learning about what changes need to happen in these schools, uh, you know, we want to try to avoid that because we also want to make sure that we where whenever possible, we are putting youth and, and their personal experiences and, and like their ideas at the forefront because at the end of the day, it really does impact them um, the most. But I'll open it up to see if anybody else wants to add or address this specific question before we move on. No, I think your your answer was really complete, Irene. Uh, just wanted to say that, you know, those helping with those uh, and focusing on those local campaigns can have a statewide impact. I mean or a nationwide impact. I feel like the advocacy that Bob did over the last decade that culminated in the elimination of the, of the Oakland Unified School Police Department really was national news and inspired that conversation across not just California, but across the country. So it may feel like it's a very local effort, but in fact, it can really, really have statewide implications. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, and I think this might be the last question, at least in the Q&A box. Um, the question is, is anyone using community restorative circles to let all stakeholders explore ways to resolve the police on campus problem? I have not heard of this, George, but I um, think it's a really interesting idea. Have, has anybody done this or explored it? Yeah, type, uh, we lost, uh, we got about 45 folks left online. So if, if you do have experience, type it in the chat. Um, we're always looking for good examples. Um, yeah, from my experience, uh, many, many bad examples of folks who purport to be uh, investing in restorative justice, but not doing it meaningfully. So type in the chat. Oh, there was one more question about police decertification. Um, uh, just noting that, yes, uh, we are sponsoring that bill, SB2. Um, and so let me type in the chat, um, uh, like a summary of it and ways to get involved. Uh, it's a very, very important bill. Great, awesome. All right. Um, and I think oh, I'm just like, George is doing it in Marin County. <laughs> yeah. All right, George. So we may be pointing people to you. And I'm also just taking a look at the chat box. I don't think there's any more questions. Um, let me just do one quick check. But if there are no more questions, um, again, I just wanted to thank you all, uh, one, for sticking around, because I know it's a little bit past five, but I know those were all really important um, questions. And I know many of you were really looking forward to getting some specific answers to them. So again, I just want to thank uh, one, of course, my colleagues, uh, all the our guests and all our partners and the youth, and of course, everyone that attended the webinar. I, I hope you all, you know, got a lot of useful information and can now um, use the report in some of your personal, local advocacy, wherever you may find yourself. Um, and again, we'll make sure to send out the recording and the slides as soon as possible so that you all have all the information that we shared with you all today. And so with that, just thank you everybody and have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you all.